At Mora at Mora. You may have heard of this mythical place many a times during your playthroughs of Skyrim. Talos of At Mora, the return of Isgrimor and his 500 companions, the land of frozen bearded kings. There are quite a few stories and legends surrounding this long lost homeland of the Nords, and according to archaeology and historical accounts of others, it is the homeland of all men, with the exception of the Red Guards, who hail from Yakuta. Welcome to Fudge Muppet, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Scott, and today I'm here to tell you all about the ancient land of At Mora. And also speculate a little bit to try and make sense of the chronology, which as we all know is quite difficult when you start stepping back thousands of years into Elder Scrolls prehistory of the Marathic and Dawn eras. So before we start diving into the mythology surrounding Atmora, let's discuss the more straightforward stuff about the place. Both the texts before Ages of Man and Frontier Conquest and Accommodation, a social history of Cyrodiil, attest to the idea of man's original homeland being Atmora. The earliest archaeological evidence for human settlements on Tamriel date back to the late Marethic era, about 1,000 to 800 years before the beginning of the first era, which is also centuries before Isgrimor's arrival. This group of humans were collectively known as the Needs, and they spread through Hyrock, Hammerfell, and Cyrodiil. However, what caused the distinguished difference between Nord and Need in a few centuries of separation is unknown, but we have some speculation regarding this to talk about later. We also know in modern times Atmora is seemingly uninhabitable and any civilization there has gone. Ever since the arrival of Isgrimor, it is said that Atmora's climate worsened, getting colder and colder, eventually becoming the frozen wasteland that was bound in a permanent winter with very little life and no sign of human habitation. This was all reported by expeditions that ventured to the northern land in the mid-late Third Era, so it is likely that the situation has continued in this fashion well into the Fourth Era. However, prior to this, it would seem that Isgrimor and his companions were not the last migrants from Atmora, and a little segment from the Wolf Queen Volume 4 suggests that at the time of the setting, which is the early Third Era, there were still human inhabitants on the land. The last large-scale migration or invasion recorded was in the 68th year of the First Era, when two Atmoran ships laden with corpses begged to make port in Tamriel. But beyond that, we only have record of individuals, or perhaps small groups, claiming that they came from Atmora. King Izmir Wulfarth, born in the 5th century of the First Era, had been born in Atmora and came to Skyrim, which seems likely to be true, as from what record we have, Atmora seemed to have human habitation until the mid-Third Era. However, the last individual we know of with supposed descent from Atmora is Tiber Septim. Now, it is plausible, as he was alive during the late Second Era, which predates the last seen human existence there. But then again, there are sources suggesting this born in Atmora story is made up to reinforce his prestige and claim to Emperor. So that covers all the bases about Atmora from a more factual standpoint. In summary, Needs came from Atmora 1000 to 800 years before the First Era. Centuries later, Isgrimor and his 500 come. Atmora's climate begins to descend into a frozen wasteland, with the last suggestion of human civilization being around the early Third Era. But now you have an understanding of the facts, let's look at the society of ancient Atmora and the myth that surrounds this mythical ice land. Atmora was not always a frozen wasteland. Once it was a green, albeit cold land. One could imagine it was somewhat similar to Skyrim today. The word Atmora in the Aldmeris language roughly translates to Elder Wood, and to me at least, this implies that there are many forests there as well, along with the facts that they recognized Hermaeus Mora as a being called the Woodland Man, and they were also avid shipmakers, which requires lots of wood. Ilkafric was a coastal Atmoran city with massive shipyards yards, the place where the fleet for the 500 companions was built. These same Atmorans apparently had no agriculture and subsisted off hunting alone. We could probably look at the Skull tribe of Solstheim as a potentially similar example of the Atmoran lifestyle. Atmorans could have hunted hawkers, mammoths, perhaps bison. I tend to imagine Ice Age-like megafauna there well adapted to the cold, and considering there are saber cats and mammoths in Skyrim, I don't think that is too unreasonable of a guess. Also, to sustain their civilization on hunting alone, I imagine there would have to be large creatures that pay off with lots of usable meat. Perhaps they used frost magic or ancient Stalarim freezers to preserve their food, which makes a society living off hunting alone much more feasible. Considering that there are also a seafaring people, fishing also seems likely, and perhaps whaling too, which would be another large source of calorie-dense fatty meat. 
It is difficult to determine a lot about Atmora, mainly because they were a pre-literate society, meaning they had no formal writing system or written records. In fact, it was Isgrimor that is credited with devising a runic transcription of Atmoran speech based on principles of Elvish writing. Frastus of Ellen here considers him to be the first human historian for this reason. In his book, The Onus of the Ogma, he quotes the first volume of the Songs of the Return. Therefore, I strung long launcher with the woeful bowstring and sought the marshes of the east, where dwelt Faldrosta the great snow goose, and I slew her with a hawk-fletched dart, and plucked of her a great quill, which I used to write down my speech as I had seen the elves do, and I vowed that henceforth all men should record their ideas and thoughts, just as Shaw carved a record of his victory over Sneg into the side of Shivering Glacier, and in this way would the best ways of killing elves be preserved. Because written record keeping began with the colonization of Skyrim, it's hard to know at Moran culture in its totality. However, we could rightly assume that it formed the basis of Nordic culture in the eras to come. We do know that animal worship played a big part in at Moran culture, as you could expect from a society that depended on hunting and fishing for its existence. The totemic animal symbols that you find in ancient Nordic ruins on puzzles and doors have their roots in at Moran religion. Animals such as the hawk, wolf, snake, moth, owl, whale, bear, and fox, as well as the dragon, were worshipped. Scholars believe that these animal totems correspond with their Adric divines or other Adric entities with some speculation. Shore is associated with the fox, which also aligns with typical fox descriptions of crafty, cunning, and clever, especially if, like the elves believe, that he tricked the other Adra into creating Mundus at expense of their power. Sun, the shield thane of Shore, is associated with the bear, Kine is associated with the hawk, fitting for a god of the air. Mara is associated with the wolf. Debella is associated with the moth, a beautiful creature. Stun, you may know as Stendar, is associated with the whale. Junal, or Julianos, is associated with the owl. Orki, god of mortality, is associated with the snake. And finally, Alduin, of course, is associated with the dragon. Remember, all of these are in part speculative, but many such descriptions are found in ancient Nordic tombs. Another Atmoran god we know of is the Woodland Man, also known as Hermamora, aka Hermaeus Mora, who was an antagonistic figure and still is in Skull mythology. We also know for sure that the dragon cult, and by extension, dragons, inhabited Atmora before it came to Skyrim. In the book Dragon War by Torhal Bjorn, it states, in Atmora, where Isgrimor and his people came from, the dragon priests demanded tribute and set down laws and codes of living that kept peace between dragons and men, which tells of a different relationship between dragons and men when compared to Tamriel. In Tamriel, they were not nearly as benevolent. It is unclear if this was due to an ambitious dragon priest or a particular dragon or a series of weak kings. So in summary, beyond a doubt we can know that Admora was once a cold green land with forests and its people worshipped animal gods and they hunted and fished to sustain their civilization. Atmorans undoubtedly lay the foundations for Nordic civilization, so why is it that the Needs were so unlike the Nords in terms of biology and in culture, despite coming from the same place? The latter could be explained away by elven suppression of culture, but the Needs and Proto-Nords are very differently physically. And how do we reconcile the idea that the Nords were born on the throat of the world, made by Kine. Nords today sometimes refer to themselves as sons and daughters of Kine, though this could just be tossed aside as poetic myth. Most of all, how do the elves fit into all of this? It's interesting to note that in the book, The Monomyth, the elven view of things claims that elves once ruled the land of Atmora, which they called Altmora, meaning Elderwood. Oriel could not save Altmora, the Elderwood, and it was lost to men. They were chased south and east to old Elnafe, and Lorcan was close behind. He shattered that land into many. To translate, Old Elnafe refers to Aldmeris, the mythical lost continent where Mer are believed to all come from. Though, to throw a spanner in the works, Aldmeris could be fake, rather a cultural, philosophical idea of the elves' home rather than a literal land. And at that, the land is likely the old large landmass continent that gets shattered, so therefore it no longer exists. Drew has a great video on this linked in the description, and as you probably know, Lorcan is the same entity that the Nords call sure. So the passage above to me at least seems to imply that Auriel, the elven god of time, either ruled or just helped an elven kingdom or society that lived in the Elderwood, aka Atmora. And according to them, it was lost to men. 
So what does this mean in context? Firstly, this is all happening in the Dawn Era and perhaps part of the Merethic Era. Basically, the times of a history that are really hard to get concrete information on. Remember, the Dawn Era doesn't even have linear time as we know it. It's very confusing and potentially paradoxical. If you want further elaboration on the complexities of the gods and creation, check out the complete guide to gods in the description when you have some time. But regardless, I'm still going to try and make sense of this passage from the monomyth, which may reconcile all the mythical origins of the races with factual ones. So let's imagine that we have this Altmora, the Elderwood, the Kingdom of Elves, and remember the line, he shattered the land into many, which could imply that Lorcan or Shaw, as he is called by the Nords, was responsible for dividing Atmora from Tamriel. The annotated Anuad says, this war reshaped the face of Nern, sinking much of the land beneath new oceans, and leaving the lands as we know them, Tamriel, Akavir, Atmora, and Yakuda. The old Elnafe realm, although ruined, became Tamriel. The remnants of the Wanderers were left divided on the other three continents. So first we have a kingdom of elves to the north of this one landmass, and presumably there were also other elven kingdoms throughout this same landmass. According to the annotated Anuad, there are also men, or as they were in ancient times called the Wandering Elnafe, that came to this one landmass. We could assume that they very much resembled the base Nedic stock, or some kind of proto-human. Wars were breaking out, so this could be the time where Kine breathed life into the throat of the world and created the Nords. Fitting in with their creation story. You see, Shaw, aka Lorcan, had Kine as his wife, and perhaps Kine made the Nords upon the throat of the world so that they could help the other men, aka the wandering Elnafe, defeat the elves in the wars. This could make sense with Shaw and his armies fighting against Oriel and his armies. Remember, Nern's land is one giant landmass at this moment. So these new Nords created directly by Kine, similar but different to other men, charged forward in the armies of Shaw and attacked the Elderwood Kingdom of elves. As the monomyth states, the elves were chased south and east to Old Elnafe, aka Old Maris, which is believed to be in the annotated Anuad what Tamriel is today. Then Shaw shattered the land into many, which left remnants of the wanderers, aka the men, on the lands of Akavir, Yakuta, and Atmora. So as an explanation to why the Nords are different, perhaps it was that they were created by Kine to help in the war, explaining the biological differences between Nord and Need. As to why they migrated separately back to Tamriel, it could be a multi multitude of factors. Perhaps Atmora became exceedingly harsh and cold, causing the proto-needs to migrate to Tamriel, leaving only the frost-resistant and hardy Atmorans, or rather the proto-nords, at Atmora. It could be instead that these two groups of men could have come into conflict with one another, resulting in some fleeing to Tamriel. Also consider that they could have inhabited separate parts of the land at that time, resulting in different ethnicities, which is supported by the volume 24 of the Song of Return, which says, one such crew was that of Krillot Lok, sinewy long folk from the eastern edge of Atmora. Their ruddy skin matched the dawn, and it was often said that the morning herself learned her glorious colors from the first faces to meet her at the break of day. But overall, if we take what the annotated Anuad and the monomyth says as truth, then it easily makes sense that the Nords were created by Kine on the throat of the world, and then after the sundering of the giant landmass, they were on the northern part, essentially what became Atmora. So I think that this reconciles the idea that they were both created on the throat of the world, which is in Skyrim, and also they are from Atmora. In ways, the return to Skyrim could be seen as a return to their birthplace in this regard. It's also interesting that when you look at the Nordic and Altmeri pantheons and notice that there are not many similarities, and perhaps if the ancient Atmorans and Altma worship different gods, it could make sense that these wars happened, with certain gods on either side. According to the varieties of faith, the only gods that cross over in the Nordic and Altmeri pantheons are Mara, Stendar, and Alduin, kind of. Mara, in Altmeri belief, is stated to be the wife of Auriel, and is also associated with the female principle, called Ner, that gave gave birth to creation, and perhaps this was initially the case, but what's interesting is that in the Nordic pantheon, Kine is Shaw's wife, but Mara is Shaw's concubine and Kine's handmaiden. Perhaps Mara left Auriel and became Shaw's side piece, causing some serious animosity between the gods and the Elnafe, but then again, this could be a too literal of a look at things. But 
Have a look at Stendar, considered the apologist of men in the Ultimary Pantheon, whereas Stun in the Nordic Pantheon is a warrior god and shield thane of Shore who fought against the Oldmeri Pantheon. Perhaps he switched sides and swore his blade to Shore during the Elnafe Wars. The Alduin Akatosh Oriel dynamic is quite messy, but to be honest, it's probably better to see them as strictly distinct gods, especially at this time in history. Consider that in the Dawn and Morethic eras, the eight divines as you know them were not even conceived of. Ultimately, the point is that perhaps. Perhaps there is far more sense to these at first seemingly paradoxical accounts and stories of the Dawn and Morethic eras. I'm going to leave the whole Atmora frozen in time theory for another video because that requires a lot more explanation and deviations from the topic at hand, but what else is there to say about Atmora? Well, interestingly, giants, the tall lumbering creatures, are said to have shared ancestry with the Nords, an ancestry with roots in Atmora. Giants, a discourse by Cor the Curious, states that the Atmorans were huge and smart. Nords descended from these ancient folk became the small, relatively speaking, intelligent people that we are today. Giants, on the other hand, became the huge, stupid creatures that we watch from a distance. Perhaps these ancient, giant, and smart Atmorans were the same proto-Nords created by Kine on the throat of the world that helped defeat the elven kingdom of Ultmora. Then, after the wars, after Shaw's death, perhaps then the races began dividing into the giants and Nords that we know today. Other myths and legends corroborate the existence existence of giants on Atmora, such as Isgrimor collecting the laments of giant wives, but regardless, this division of races and claimed common ancestry does paint an image of Kine's original creation being far more powerful than the Nords of today. That is, of course, if you choose not to disregard the Nordic creation story entirely, but like we previously stated, it can make sense with the established information. But alas, Hatmora today is but a frozen wasteland with little life. As the tribunal god Vivek states in his sermons, they walked to the north to the Elderwood and found nothing but frozen bearded kings. Tamriel's knowledge of Atmora, the land of truth as it is sometimes called, is very scarce. Ever since the days of High King Harald, 13th of Isgrimor's dynasty, and first to relinquish all holdings in Atmora. This is why he is considered the first historical Nord ruler, as he no longer had any connection to the ancient homeland of Atmora. But then again, perhaps, if the stories are to be believed, Maybe they were finally in their homeland of Skyrim and relinquished at Mora their temporary home. What do you think about all this? What are your theories regarding the origins of the Nords? Give the video a like if you enjoy these kinds of discussions and please do subscribe for more Elder Scrolls lore content just like this. My name is Scott from Fudge Muppets. It's been a pleasure to be here with you today and I look forward to nerding out with you again next time.